Yep, Julian. Okay. All right. Welcome everyone back to the to the Tech Fest. Um, this this is this special event that's been organised by the Indian chapter, uh, along with uh, uh, the meetups from around Asia Pacific and uh, the African chapter. So uh, this is the third. Uh, so welcome back. Uh, we have a great uh, uh, schedule today. Uh, we have, uh, as, as this event is all about, it's about meeting the maintainers and contributors uh, from, uh, from the Hyperledger projects. Uh, we have uh, people from Cactus Labs, we have BAF, which uh, I think we're going to have a demo uh, today on, which uh, we went through last, uh, last session, and we have uh, Aries. So uh, please, and the messaging uh, that I, I think the message that we want to give is that please listen to, to these maintainers, contributors, uh, and everyone wants more people to get involved. So I think they, everyone wants more people involved in this project. It's all about us working together uh, and developing this technology together. So with that, I'm going to hand you over to the person who's arranged and organized this, Arun. Arun, please uh, take over from here. Thank you. Thank you, Julian, for the great introduction. And in today's session, we will have three different topics which we'll cover. And upon request by the audience in the last session, we are going to have a demo session on the blockchain automation framework. And our first event for the day would be um, on Hyperledger Cactus. And thanks to Peter and Jonathan who are joining us from far, far away place. And I know it's too late for you guys. And we really appreciate you take, making out time for this session. Over to you, Peter. Problem. Uh, I'll just ask for the forgiveness of everyone in case I uh, talk a little slower than usual. And let me share my slides. Can you see the slides? Yes. Yes. My name is Peter. I work for Accenture as a technology architect. And uh, regarding the project, Hyperledger Cactus, I just wanted to start with a safe harbor sort of thing where I just stated very clearly that the project is in incubation status, so we don't have a 1.0 fixed stable release yet, so it is not ready for production. So everything I say about the future is uh, sort of a forward-looking statement. And with that out of the way, uh, what is Cactus? It is, in very short, an SDK of SDKs for developing applications that have to use distributed ledgers. And uh, we really hope that it is a pluggable sort of framework that also will be enterprise grade in the sense that uh, you can count on it being uh, available and uh, stable and maintained for years to come and also uh, backwards compatible where possible, not everywhere, of course. And then uh, to answer the question why, it's to mainly to address fragmentation. Uh, blockchain is very popular nowadays. It's the adoption is happening and uh, there's a lot of different proposals out there for how to actually build a ledger. And it makes it very difficult as a, as a business application user. It makes it difficult to figure out what it is that you can uh, put in your architectures and what it isn't. Uh, if you want future proofing, then you really need to somehow have a, a way out in case the technology that you picked actually ends up not being so great on the long run or just gets discontinued. So that's one thing. And uh, the other one is just the obvious one for every framework that's out there in software is to try to save people from having to reinvent the wheel. And then uh, the third one, which I kind of already described, is to lower the risk of adoption. And then if you want to think about how bad the fragmentation is, it's actually much worse than you would imagine at first, because the number of integrations, if you want to be um, a 
let's say optimistic, or if you want to have high standards and say that in your ideal world, every ledger or different blockchain should be able to talk to every other blockchain, then the number of integrations between these uh, different blockchains goes up quadratically with the number of ledgers that are there, meaning that if you just have a hundred different ledgers, which we have thousands right now, but if you just have a hundred, then uh, you end up requiring 5,000 different integration scenarios. So that's not really sustainable, especially if you take into account that there isn't really a framework out there to combine all of these. So if you want any sort of larger scale enterprise business application today, then this is uh, this is your reality, basically. So we intend to make that easier. And then uh, just to clarify our position in the high ledger greenhouse, we are right there. Uh, we are in the pools category, but technically, I could make arguments for us being in almost any one of those boxes except for the distributed ledgers box. We are definitely not a ledger, but I could say that it is a library because it really depends on how you're using it, what is your persona within the organization that uses Cactus, because if you are an application developer, then for you, it's more of a library. But if you are a person who's uh, in operations, then you could think of Cactus as a tool for uh, integrating ledgers, basically. And here's a very, very generic use case. This is intentionally overly simplified just to demonstrate that we're not a ledger, we are something that gets put between ledgers and a user application so that the user application gets to deliver value. And, uh, and that's it. So I, I will expand on this much more later, especially if I have time, but uh, this is the very high level scenario. And then a few quick design principles. The most important one is the plugin architecture, which is uh, all about us trying to remain flexible because we don't claim to know what is the optimal design. I don't, I personally, I don't think anyone knows for sure. It's, uh, it's much easier to decide or judge these things after the fact. And so, our strategy is to try to keep the design flexible in a way that if next year or two years from now down the line, we start to see sort of emerging uh, patterns that been out sort of, then we can adapt to it. Even if initially we did not think to do that particular design. And then uh, second most important, well, I, I guess I could say it is also the most important is uh, secure by default. So we really don't want uh, minor things to just take it spiral out of control with security. So this is an important uh, design principle, even if it seems trivial, but uh, we want to clarify that we don't have uh, the insecure defaults such as, you know, when you deploy a software and then it boots up and then it has admin for the username and admin for the password for the complete rights. And then uh, toll free, which is a little clarification. So Cactus is open source and is being developed in the open. And also if you deploy it, then uh, by default, there's no any sort of payment mechanism in it that would make you have to either collect or pay any sort of fees. Uh, it's, it's, it's basically up to you. If you want to implement something where payment is required, then you can do so, but it, nothing like that is baked into the framework. 
and then uh, low impact deployment, which I kind of already described, but I want to reiterate that we are separate from the ledgers. So in this sense, the ideal scenario is that you already have ledgers that you want to integrate, and then you can deploy Cactus to do just that without actually having to modify the ledgers themselves. And some more design principles that I will also cover in uh, greater detail. By support, meaning that we don't just want to support like the top 10% of the ledgers, we want to make sure that we actually cover at least 99% of them. And the way we try to achieve this is to assume very little about the ledgers themselves. Basically, the most we assume about a ledger is that it is a data store that can uh, represent transactions and maybe blocks, and it is able to run uh, some sort of arbitrary code in the form of smart contracts. And then for cross ledger transactions, we made sort of the pledge for ourselves that where it's possible we want to prevent double spending but this is not always applicable because we can only do this on ledgers that have uh, <clears throat> guarantees for transaction finality otherwise things can go always somehow wrong and then uh, preserving ledger features very quickly, it just means that if your ledger has some sort of additional feature that distinguishes it from other ledgers, that feature is your pride and joy, then uh, the idea is that you should be able to integrate that ledger with other ledgers through Cactus and still uh, have that feature working in the way that you want it to, so that uh, adopting Cactus for integrating your ledgers is not a trade-off in the sense that now you have to basically lose everything that's unique about your ledger, your particular ledger. Horizontal scalability, very important. We need this because uh, it, it is derived from our performance goal, which states that we never want to be the bottleneck however fast the ledgers we are connecting are, we want to be able to handle the transaction load that those ledgers can handle. And then a quick plug for our white paper, which is up on GitHub. If you, if you want to read more, then uh, there's a, a big list of use cases there. And uh, also the rest of the design principles, which I won't continue mentioning because I would otherwise run out of time. And then getting a little closer to the fire, this is uh, the architecture on a high level. It's, uh, it's not the most up-to-date diagram, but it still works. It's uh, pretty, it makes it pretty easy to explain. The bottom line is that you have the ledgers, which can be any supported ledger. And then there's ledger plugins, which are aimed solely at establishing communication with these ledgers. And then you have a business logic plugin or even an external application that implements your business logic. And this ends up talking to the ledger plugins. And uh, the idea here is that you only need to, you or the open source community, you only need to write each ledger plugin once. And then that ledger becomes supported and anyone else can use it. So you can have two ledgers that you want to integrate or 10. As long as there's plugins written for it, you can just do so. And uh, going even closer to the implementation details, a few architectural decisions we made is to have 
code written in TypeScript, bundled with Webpack so that uh, the relevant packages that we have that make sense, they can actually be used not just uh, on the back end in an OGS environment, but also in the browser. And then uh, all this is grouped into multiple packages in the same main GitHub Cactus repository, and all of that is managed uh, through this tool called Lerna. And, and we just refer to that as the mono repo. And yes, as I mentioned, we have cross-platform packages. So for example, the API client package that we have that you can use to conveniently issue requests to the Cactus API. So that works the same way on Node.js and in the browser as well. And then the other big decision, or maybe it's just my personal pet peeve, but same thing, is uh, test automation. We focus very, very heavily on test automation. Uh, even the things that are normally not testable in the average software framework, we have all that covered. Uh, a, a big and important part of that is we actually write our own custom Docker images so that we can simulate a completely fresh, clean slate ledger for each test case, if necessary. And then more on the plugin architecture is basically, it's all about us admitting to ourselves that we don't know what the future looks like. So we just want to make sure that there is always a possibility to adapt the software by just saying, oh, well, we just need to write a new plugin that implements this in a slightly different way, but it still fits into the system because there are well-defined interfaces between the plugins and the core software itself. And regarding the governance model, the important thing about the plugins is that if you want to start developing a plugin today or any ledger that is not supported right now, you can do so and you don't even have to ever ask any one of the Cactus maintainers. In fact, if you, if you want to, for whatever reason, you can even keep that code of your plugin private because at the end of the day, Cactus allows you to inject that plugin at configuration time and then just use it. So there's no real difference between the Cactus plugins written by the maintainers, such as myself, or a plugin written by someone else who just uploaded it on NPM. And this is definitely a forward-looking statement, big time. Uh, we hope to have language agnostic plugin development as well, so that if you don't like TypeScript or JavaScript or even Node.js or any of that, then uh, ideally you could just implement the plugin in your preferred language, which could be Go, C Sharp, or Rust, or anything else that can communicate uh, through the network. And uh, we've seen a good idea elsewhere where this is implemented with Go plugins, which just ends up being a gRPC endpoint that your plugin talks to, and then the core piece of your software is able to communicate with the plugin that way. And then it really doesn't matter uh, what language your plugin is written in. It doesn't even matter what server it runs in as long as there's a network connectivity. But this is not something that we even aim to support in uh, the 1.0 version. So this is uh, definitely just a long-term goal. And so this little uh, chart demonstrates my personal thought process 
if anyone asks me what about supporting this ledger or that kind of uh, key management or authentication, all of these uh, should be in the end plugins. And then if you ask me what about supporting something along these lines, then uh, first I will say, is there a plugin? And if yes, then just use it. But if, if there isn't, then, uh, then I will evaluate what you're asking. Is that already a pluggable aspect? And by a pluggable aspect, I mean, for example, a pluggable aspect is uh, keychains and uh, ledger connectors. So meaning you can add uh, ledger connector plugins for different ledgers and you can add keychain plugins for different keychain implementations where the private keys or other secrets that you need for your business application can be stored. So if you want to add a new keychain backend, because maybe we support uh, one of the big cloud providers, key management service, but not the other cloud provider, which you happen to use, then my answer will be, okay, so you can just implement a plugin to support that and then use that plugin. And then the only edge case is if it's not a pluggable aspect, for example, if you, if you want to customize something that at currently is just hard coded in the, in the core, then it will have to have an extra step for you to be able to customize or support that behavior by first sending a pull request directly to Cactus which uh, the PR would just uh, make it so that that aspect is pluggable. And once that's done, then you can implement the plugin and use it to customize the behavior. And uh, after all this talk about plugins, I just wanted to calm the waters and uh, just lower the expectations. A plugin is super simple. This is, for example, one of the plugins that we have in the code. It's, uh, you know, it takes five seconds to read that code. I'm not going to read it all out loud. It's just an interface with a few methods that you can implement in your code. And then you can uh, feed that into Cactus as a configuration parameter and it will be used. And uh, a little more on storage. It's uh, just something I like to clarify is that, well, I clearly clarified it, but I like to clarify it multiple times, is that we are not storing uh, transactional block data as part of Cactus. We don't intend to come out with a new consensus algorithm on that either. When I say storage for Cactus, I just mean storing operational data or uh, pending transactions, things that you need to implement your business logic, but not uh, the actual data that you end up putting on the ledgers. And then uh, to talk a little more about preserving the ledger features, the other thing that I always try to make sure we clarify is that we can only do this as much as possible, but there's always a limit. And uh, the big one is, for example, privacy. If you have two ledgers and one of them supports private transactions, but another one does not, then most likely, you cannot, you can no longer have a reasonable expectation of your transaction being private since only one side guarantees it. The other side says, well, your transactions are public, not private. So despite the fact that in this scenario, Cactus would support the feature itself mechanically so that you can specify your transaction as 
private on the ledger, which does support private transactions. In the end, this ends up not being very useful for you if the other side, if the other ledger that you're transacting on is just not supporting private transactions. And I just wanted to make this uh, clear because we cannot make miracles happen in this sense. So the expectations have to be clear in this regard. And for the transaction protocol itself, as in how do you execute a cross-ledger transaction? Well, it's a, it's a moving target, sort of. The science is still being worked out on this. There's multiple different algorithms and ways to do it. Uh, so we are not settled on anything on this yet, and the design is very much a draft. But uh, basically the flow is that we don't want any unintended consequences. So both sides have to agree to the transaction before it gets finalized. And I know this is kind of vague, but this is where we are at with the fundamentals for this particular piece. And uh, yeah, this just re I did. I just want to reiterate again that uh, there could be surprises if if you expect too much from Cactus. And for example, you forget that on Bitcoin it is possible that the ledger just works, which is not under your control or our control or anybody else's control. So basically with the transaction protocol, we try to mitigate this kind of mistake as much as possible so that we don't end up with a large number of users who ended up losing funds or somehow messing up transactions otherwise. And then uh, we also intend to have batch transactions, but only where applicable. And uh, that's uh, probably not the most widespread use case, but I do see it uh, being necessary for enterprise applications because I just, I've worked a lot on uh, different database projects where databases were not ledgers, they were just relational or NoSQL databases and uh, batching transactions is always something we end up doing. And then regarding the performance, I probably also already mentioned this, what we want here is to make sure that Cactus is never the bottleneck. And we want to have published benchmarks that actually show that we ran a test where multiple ledgers were involved, everyone running transactions left and right, and the throughput of the ledgers were X, and the throughput of Cactus was basically the sum of all the throughputs of the different ledgers combined since it is the component in the middle. And then uh, now a little deeper about one of the use cases. It's uh, federated validation where what we do is basically provide an overlay network that is uh, bell stop tolerant where you can obtain um, an attestation or a signature. We are also not settled on terminology yet, but the point is that you can get a signature not just from a ledger that a transaction happened, but also from Cactus itself, which can be good if the entity running Cactus is more trusted by you than let's say the ledger, or if you have a specific relationship with that entity that runs that Cactus node. And then the way this would work is that you deploy Cactus and then you can uh, 
manage the validators that are on Cactus, logically within Cactus. And then you can ask Cactus itself to verify the payloads of transactions as they have happened on the ledger. And uh, this is about the technology stack in an actual deployment, the way we imagine it in this use case. And you can see that on the bottom of the stack, we have the ledgers, the DLT platforms. There are smart contracts deployed on these that can manage the sort of the identities or at least the public keys of the foreign validators. And then there's the SDKs or the APIs of the ledgers on top of the ledgers themselves. And then Cactus talks to those to make sure that the data that moves around is indeed validated. So in the end, what you have to write code is mostly just sits on top, but depending on the use case, you may also need to write smart contracts for the specific ledger. And then what actually happens on chain in this use case is smart contract validating the public keys, or sorry, validating the signatures uh, based on the public keys. And then what can happen off chain is your application can sit off chain as in deployed outside of the ledgers and send requests to the Cactus API to either have a transaction payload verified with a signature of that Cactus node or actually to export data from one ledger and maybe put it on another ledger depending on what is the use case. So in the end, you can move data around and you can obtain cryptographic proof that the data has been moved around. And then uh, the roadmap, which is uh, very, very much subject to change. We intend to finalize the 1.0 design and uh, the new development, a recent development regarding this is that in January, we have a meeting scheduled with the Hyperledger Technical Steering Committee to actually start talking about gathering feedback about the architecture. And we intend to specifically target maintainers of the ledgers that we are intending on supporting in the initial round. And we hope to, what we hope to get out of this is um, people saying things along the lines of, hey, Cactus is great, but I think this particular use case would just never work because of some little shortcoming or an issue with your design. And then we would take that feedback, we would go back to the drawing board and then uh, basically just do it again, make sure that what we have is flexible enough to handle what was brought up. Uh, going into a little more detail on the roadmap, we want to have support for uh, identity management. We are looking into supporting Indy, uh, DID, DIF, all these goodies. We already have some support for JSON web signatures. It's just uh, the slide hasn't been updated with that. And then uh, consortium management, we also have that. And we do not yet have plugins in different languages. So basically, this is the roadmap for now. And uh, Oh, yes, we, we also intend to have the performance benchmarks published. And then this is the, the presentation. In the end, there's just a shameless plug where I invite everyone to come hang out at the Rocket Chat or the mailing list, which you can find the link to through the wiki, which is the bottom link. And of course, to contribute, which you can do so through the link to our GitHub. 
And uh, I'm not sure if I should answer questions now or at the end. Thanks, Peter. I guess we should. I guess we should be. We should be. We should take up questions now. There is a question on Q&A portal. Samyak Jain asking that, since plugin development is externally managed, how do you ensure that Cactus will provide a uniform interface for all the underlying ledgers? So we do that by having the plugin interfaces defined by the maintainers. So you can develop your plugin anywhere. But the plugin will only work with Cactus if you implemented the specific interface definition that we publish. Awesome. So attendees, if you have more questions, then please feel free to ask them on the Q&A portal. And thanks, Peter, for the, for the excellent session. And we hope to get more contributors from this region and joining the project soon. And awesome. the recorded session will be placed on Hyperledger's YouTube channel and we'll send out those videos information as well very soon. And up next, we have our second session, the most anticipated one, I believe. We heard many people asking for this session last in, in our last session where um, they wanted to see a live demo of Hyperledger Fabric being deployed through blockchain automation framework. And now I'll hand it over to Accenture team. Over to you, uh, Shaunak and the team. Hey, thank you. Uh, I think it's not my, uh, uh, what's the spotlight today? It's, it's Priyanka and uh, Arnold and uh, uh, Suvajit, yeah. Yes, I'm sharing my screen. Um, thanks, Arun. Um, thanks, Peter. Okay, so thanks for the overwhelming Q&A last time. Um, what we're going to do today is just do a quick recap for, uh, you know, folks who did not join us last time. Uh, so just to have a starting point. And then I will straight away hand it over to the engineering team, the maintainers of uh, blockchain automation framework, uh, Shivaji and Arnold have joined and uh, Shonak is uh, our um, main architect and product owner. So if there's anything that the team cannot ha handle, then yeah, Shonak. Okay, so with that, um, so this is the agenda. Um, let me um, take you to what are we doing a recap for. So last time we just mentioned, you know, a um, lot of you don't know what Hyperledger Labs is. So I would uh, request you to go and just ha have a look for it. So it's it's like an incubation center within Hyperledger Greenhouse um, where uh, the projects that are not really going into a full-fledged project status can start the development, uh, can start and the team can start um, developing in the open source. So BAF is right now a project in incubation under Hyperledger Labs. The second thing that we discussed was, uh, you know, what problem are we solving? What is blockchain automation framework? Um, and what we discussed in detail is that what we were facing uh, internally in Accenture, where we were doing almost 100 POCs, but we didn't have a consistent way to bring up a network, to uh, make it secure, uh, how to store the keys, and uh, you know we used to spend a lot of time doing all this. So why not have uh, an automation framework which actually do, does it automatically while keeping the architecture consistent um, and secure? We then discussed on uh, what are the components that we use, um, you know, and then we went. Uh, Shonak took us through the code structure, how our code is placed in the repository. Um, and, and also through the network uh, .yaml, which is our main configuration file. It's a single file that this automation framework consumes and spins up the network. Um, in, on, in BAF components, if I can just quickly summarize that um, the comp uh, we have, uh, one thing that is mandatory is Kubernetes. Uh, we, we work um, extensively on clusters. Uh, we have Ansible, Helm charts, uh, HashiCorp Vault, um, any given cloud infrastructure and uh, GitOps Flux. So these are the components uh, used for um, the complete framework. 
So with that, um, without further ado, I would um, hand it over to uh, Shivajit today. Uh, Shivajit will take us through a little bit, a little uh, deeper in, in, in how the network is deployed. And then uh, Arnold will take us through uh, the, the features. So right. over to you, Shivajit. Thanks, Priyanka. And uh, yeah, welcome everyone to the session. Uh, before we actually move to the technical demo, uh, I'd like to kind of uh, bring your attention to this slide. So this one talks about how the automation for uh, fabric uh, DLT is done using um, blockchain automation framework. Um, I mean, people who had uh, joined the previous session must have seen this uh, slide for other DLT uh, uh, as well. So as Bra BAF promises that uh, all the DLT platforms that BAF uh, automates, it, it does it in a consistent way. So the kind of automation flow remains the same uh, with changes uh, for uh, DLT specifics. So uh, what you see on the screen is the uh, some of the main pieces of uh, BAF automation. Uh, and the automation uh, basically starts with a developer or an operator uh, config, uh, configuring or creating a config main configuration file or the single configuration file, uh, which we call as a network YAML. So that configuration file is then used by the Ansible, uh, which contains uh, playbooks, roles, uh, and um, tasks. So these, uh, the, the main, uh, the network YAML is basically, uh, the network configuration is used uh, to kind of create uh, further uh, configurations, uh, which are later used by uh, Helm. So uh, I'll talk about that uh, quickly now. So uh, once Ansible creates this configurations and uh, what Helm contains is that it contains charts, uh, the basically the Helm charts, which uh, contains uh, various jobs or deployments or the services, which, uh, which kind of uses the configurations uh, provided by the Ansible as uh, values. So we call them value files as well. So these uh, charts uses that value files and passes it as an instruction to Kubernetes and then Kubernetes uh, does the deployment of whether it's a deployment or a job or any service which is required. Uh, what you also see on the screen is uh, the Docker. Uh, so Docker is basically, it can be a private or a public repository. In our case, uh, it's a, a public repository under Hyperledger Labs. It contains uh, all the official uh, Fabric images uh, provided by Fabric. So th those images are basically used by either uh, the um, containers uh, in the Kubernetes or uh, it is used by Ansible to create cryptos or uh, yeah, uh, different artifacts required for the uh, network deployment. Uh, with this understanding of uh, uh, the automation flow, I'll move to the next uh, one. So uh, what we have as a technical demo, and uh, first we'll, we'll just talk about the baseline of the technical demo. And uh, what we already have is a BAF deployed Hyperledger fabric network. So uh, it's a fabric network with 2.2 version. So uh, just one important note is that this is the first time we are kind of demoing the uh, Fabric version 2.2. Uh, by the end of the session, I'll also provide uh, you with a link of uh, Fabric uh, network deployment of an of the older version uh, 1.4. Uh, but in for this part of technical demo, this is a baseline that we already have an existing network deployed uh, with Fabric version 2.2. Now, uh, just to kind of talk about uh, the uh, architecture of the um, uh, network, basically how the network has been, uh, I mean, created, is that uh, we, ha I mean, uh, the nomenclature and basically the architecture is based on a use case that we uh, use. The use case is about uh, the supply chain uh, logistic um, application. So we all do also have a um, ref app, uh, which you can find in our uh, root directory under examples folder of our uh, root directory in GitHub. So under that, we have the uh, ref app for a supply chain. So uh, the, I mean, just briefly on the use case, the use case is about um, the uh, logistic supply chain uh, where um, containers and products created by the uh, manufacturer are shipped to different parties. Uh, so here uh, in our uh, use case or the network, uh, the supply chain organization uh, hosts the orders. It does not have any peers or, uh, and uh, just hosts the orders. The other participating organizations are manufactured with a uh, single peer, uh, a single peer and organization also with a single peer, all communicating on a single channel. So uh, uh, with this, uh, 
and I'll, I'll move to the uh, operational features which we are going to demo today. So I mean, uh, expanding on the uh, use case, uh, what we want to do is that we want to add a new organization, a store organization to the uh, existing channel. So uh, I mean, uh, also we'll remove that particular organization. So what we're gonna show is that, uh, I mean, the whole complex process of adding and removal uh, can be done uh, uh, using BAF uh, in a consistent way as we shown in the previous slide. So in fact, for the features uh, for adding removal and as well as the last feature, which we're going to talk about, uh, we are not going to demo because, uh, I mean, as I said, the Fabric 2.2 is something which is still work in progress. Uh, we have a feature branch on which we are still working on it. So uh, we're going to talk about the last part of adding a new pair, but uh, for addition and removal, we'll do a um, pre-recorded uh, demo for that. So what we're going to show there is that how the whole process has been uh, automated by BAP. So with that, uh, I'll move to the uh, first part and that's about adding a new organization. So I'll hand over to Avnard who will take you through the uh, details of that step. Yes, uh, thank you, Surjit, for the introduction and uh, Priyanka for your introduction as well. I'll go ahead uh, by sharing my screen. So um, before we actually go ahead with um, starting the actual demo, uh, I'd first like to set the stage again for the people that didn't join the last meeting. I'll just quickly recap uh, what has been said in the last meetup. Um, so what Suvajit has already mentioned is that with Buff, uh, we want to uh, automate that tedious process of deploying the blockchain. Uh, and that can be done uh, by executing one command on a terminal and then everything will be automated. So uh, the file that you see here is basically our uh, master, um, master configuration file, our master playbook um, that will be run when setting up the initial network. So here you see our site.yaml is basically a file that will um, spin up specific uh, playbooks uh, based on the network type. And this master playbook will take uh, the network YAML that uh, Priyanka has mentioned before as an input. So to also show that network.yaml, I won't uh, open all the specifics, but we have some certain basic information for each of the network YAMLs. So depending on your network type, you will have a different um, type here. So in this case, we'll be deploying Hyperledger Fabric with version 2.2. Uh, um, you have some environment variables and the Docker credentials, which will be used to uh, fetch the Docker images that have been mentioned by Suvajit before. Uh, in this case, like he mentioned, we will have uh, uh, three orders. Um, in this case, we will have one channel, uh, which will be joined by all the organizations uh, that we have defined below. So at the top, we always have the order organization. Uh, in this case, it's one organization with three orders. This can also be multiple organizations. It's just depending on your network setup. And then we have the three organizations below. So um, what you can do is by executing that master playbook that I've showed before with uh, this network.yaml uh, as an input, you will um, deploy a complete network, which will basically give you um, this state. So I'll zoom in a bit and full screen it. So what you see here is that with the Kubernetes CLI, uh, we've fetched all the pods that are uh, in the uh, Hyperledger deployment. So what you see here on the left is that uh, we have a bunch of namespaces associated to each of the, um, the networks and the organizations that we have defined. Uh, important to note here is that normally in, the, in a production environment, uh, we would have multiple clusters. So each of the organization would have a separate uh, Kubernetes cluster, uh, which they can manage themselves. Um, but for our development purposes, uh, we develop on one cluster because that makes it easier uh, to, uh, to do and then we separate those organizations by the namespace. So everything that is within the carrier net namespace is for the carrier organization and so forth for the uh, manufacturer, the uh, supply chain net, which is basically the order organization. So it's kind of a network operator. And then at the bottom, you see uh, the warehouse organization. Um, every uh, organization will have some common uh, pods and jobs that were run during this deployment. Uh, so for example, you see some pods that are in the running state. So these are the actual active uh, components that will um, stay up and running 
while the network is as well. So for example, here you see the uh, peer on the carrier network and you see it's CLI, which we can use to, uh, for example, query the chain codes, invoke the chain codes, uh, things like that. You see the um, certificate authority and the certificate authority tools, uh, which I will dive in deeper because we will use those extensively when uh, creating a new organization and adding it to the network. And then the completed um, pods, uh, those are not really pods, they are jobs that run. So they will spin up some pods in the meanwhile to execute some actions. And when they will be done, they will be spun down again. So in the case of every organization, we will have a job that will join the organization and its peers to the channel uh, that we have created. And then there are some actions that we will do for the chain code. Uh, so for Fabric 2.2, uh, we've implemented the new, uh, the life cycle. So previously you would have a different uh, way of uh, installing and uh, invoking chain codes to a channel. But now with Fabric 2.2, one of the biggest changes is that there's now a life cycle associated with the chain codes. So you have some different steps that will be done. So you have each organization will install the chain code. And then by the creator of the channel, uh, it will commit and approve the chain code to the channel. And that endorsement will then be um, basically be on that channel. So every uh, organization on a channel will have approved chain code. All right, so now that we've um, set the stage for the initial baseline of the demo, uh, I will start the first video of the deployment. I apologize if it's still a, a bit small on your screen, uh, but I will talk you through what exactly we're going to see uh, on this video. Uh, so on the left, um, I've split my terminal in uh, two pieces. On the left, we have our Ansible playbook command. So this is the command that will execute the deployment of um, our fabric network. So the first input is that um, configuration file. Important to note when adding a new organization file that we have a sort of a, a new master playbook. So if I just go to my code, first we have this site.yaml, which will be used for the main network deployment for the first initial time that you spin up the network. But now that we are adding a new organization, we will have to use a different uh, master playbook. So what you see here is that it's named add organization. Um, and this will have uh, a bunch of roles that are executed in sequence um, to make sure that everything will go uh, right. And I'll kind of link those roles that are mentioned here with different timestamps in the video uh, later. But with adding a new organization, we will also have a different configuration file because there's obviously a new organization that will be joining the network. Uh, so we need some additional info and some of the existing values will be changed. So in, uh, here we have the previous uh, network.yaml and then we will uh, switch to a new uh, network.yaml uh, that will have these new organizations. So we see here that the first four organizations will still be um, the same organizations that we've used before. And then at the bottom, uh, we will add a new organization. So for the supply chain, um, supply chain use case, we'll be adding the new um, participant in the chain. So the package will eventually be uh, delivered to a store. So we'll be adding a store organization to our network. And uh, that store organization will have all the prerequisite information that a organization needs to have. So the subject will be used for the certificates. Uh, we have some uh, information about our AWS, uh, Kubernetes and Vault. But the most important thing within the adding of a new organization is this organization status. So the organization status in our configuration file can have multiple values. So in this case, uh, a new organization will have the um, organization status new. And if we then open uh, another organization, so this warehouse, we have already added to the network. So we know that it is an existing network. Uh, and then uh, our BAF automation will know, okay, this is an existing network. I do not have to uh, spin up anything new for this one. I will just use the existing resources that are already deployed in the network. So in the meanwhile, I'll start the video. Um, and while on the left, our playbook is running with that network.yaml as an input, on the right, uh, we see the Kubernetes pods that will be coming up as the demo progresses. So each time when a role is uh, 
completed and a Helm file is generated, it will be picked up by our um, Flux pods, the GitHub Flux, uh, which will be synced to our repository. And then those um, Helm deployments will uh, spin up pods as we go. So um, at first, you see uh, the basic uh, uh, infrastructure prerequisites uh, spinning up. So we will test our Kubernetes connection to the clusters. And we will check uh, if our role credentials are valid. And in this case, we're using uh, AWS as our cloud provider. So it will download the CLI tools. It will uh, configure that so we can use that in our deployment. So um, one, once I skip uh, past a couple of minutes, uh, so the first minutes will be used to set up the prerequisites. And then if I skip to about um, six or seven minutes, we see here that our first um, our first main component will become up. So in this case, on the right, we have uh, our CA uh, coming up, which is the certificate authority. Uh, and that is the main component, like I said, that we will use to generate the certificate for the organization. So if we then swap to our uh, playbook, we see here that uh, eventually it will include the role to create a CA server. So our roles in, in BAF, we really uh, named them uh, explanatory. So basically the name of that role will tell you exactly what that role will do without you having to understand what the uh, underlying uh, logic is. So this will spin up the creates a DCA server, which will take some inputs, uh, which are configured in your network.yaml. So it's really specific to that organization. And in this case, um, the important thing is again, here you have that organization status. So it will loop through the organizations which you have defined in your network.yaml. But in this case, we only want to spin up the new organization. So again, we will here filter on the status, which is new. So um, the certificate authority and the certificate authority tools, which is basically the kind of CLI that we will use, uh, will be spun up in the meanwhile. So we will just continue the demo. And then um, once those two tools are running, so I'll skip again ahead. So in the meanwhile, the value files are generated. It's pushed to the uh, repository, and it will be synced. So once that is done, then we see here that there are two pods which are now running. So that means at this point in our deployment, we have those two um, things running. So um, one step that we do is in the middle, we will add a pass to the network.yaml uh, to, to our deployment, um, which is basically to, uh, uh, to prevent our certificates from not being valid. So by sleeping for six minutes, we make sure that our certificates are valid and we can use them to uh, continue in our deployment. Uh, but before we are sleeping, we are doing some uh, really uh, critical things for this uh, uh, adding of a new organization. So we are doing uh, two important things. So once you see the uh, CA server and the CA tools, when that is done, then we will um, generate some scripts, um, which will be used to add a new organization. Um, the first thing that we will do is generate a um, crypto script for that new organization, um, which is a script that is um, filled based on a template. So here we have a template of a, of a, a script, which is quite uh, complicated. I won't go into the specifics, but what we see is that we are um, basically parsing some values which are based on a network.yaml within this script. So this script will be um, basically um, configured based on the specifics of your new organization. So the so script will never be the same for each organization. Um, what the script will do is um, it will um, generate the configuration block of that fabric network based on the organization that we have already have. It will add that new organization to that block. Um, and then once we calculate the difference between um, those two configuration blocks, we know, okay, this is the part from the new organization. And we can add that to the existing block to make sure that all the um, um, organizations in that fabric network know okay, we have a new organization that will be joining us. We all need to be up to date on that. And then once that is um, created, then we will just save that to the Ansible host. Uh, and then that will be used later to actually push that to the network. So um, while we are waiting a couple of minutes 
to uh, make sure it sleeps. We'll just leave this running. Um, and then afterwards, once we see here, we see the network is sleeping. Uh, and then we will use the previously generated um, crypto script to create the crypto material for the organization. So um, what we'll do again is create the crypto scripts for each organization which has the status of new. Um, and we will use a different template for that. Let me just check uh, if I have that open. So the crypto script, um, which is again a, a template that we have um, for the script. So the baseline is the same across all of the organizations. But again, we see within those double curly brackets that we parse in some uh, specific values which are based on the organization itself. So uh, we see some uh, variables being set. And then at the bottom, it will use the binaries from Fabric. So in this case, it will use the CA client um, to generate those certificates. So once we have um, basically um, made a, a bash script out of this template, we will then um, execute that um, script on the certificate authority. So this, this will already have the existing certificates, which we have fetched from our HashiCorp fault. Uh, so it has the uh, key stores uh, and it has the right uh, binaries. So we can use the certificate authority to generate the certificates for that new organization, which is the certificate authority that we have spun up before. So this is why we first spin up the certificate authority and its CLI so that we can use that later. Um, and then uh, afterwards, once that is done, um, I'll move to the next step. So um, we will create our config TX. Um, so um, based on the network.yaml, as mentioned here, we will create the uh, YAML file uh, for the config TX binary. Um, meanwhile, we'll also be putting some stuff in the vault, which will be used uh, later. Um, and then that will be used uh, by the config TX gen binary in the next step where we actually go ahead and create those channel artifacts. So again, here we have a, uh, a channel artifacts role, which will uh, just create everything that this new organization will need to be able to join the channel. Um, so if I then skip ahead a bit, um, let's see. Uh, so we see here that our playbook is still running. We, we have not um, spun anything up yet because now we still do that configuration to make sure that this new organization will be able to join our network. And then in the next step, uh, we will use that previously generated config block uh, that I have mentioned to um, start the, uh, uh, the peer CLI for that new organization. We will temporarily spin that up. Um, and then um, we will fetch that configuration block, um, modify it. So then we can add, as we said, those delta, that delta, the difference between the old configuration block and the new configuration block. Uh, we can modify it and then we can uh, push that back uh, to the organizations once it is signed by the uh, organizations, which will come to later. Um, once that is done, we can actually go ahead with spinning up uh, the peers for that new organization. So here again, you see the create peers role. So again, this is quite self-explanatory. Uh, we again have some inputs from our network.yaml. And in this case, we will again be deploying the new organization. So if I go back to my video uh, at about uh, 17 minutes, so we'll take about eight to nine minutes to do the pre-configuration we see that our peer will start spinning up. So it will use the previously generated configuration files to spin up that peer. And um, now that we've done that, um, we can um, have the new configuration block be signed by uh, all of the peers in the network. So we will call uh, the sign and update role, uh, which will fetch the block from the Ansible host, which is basically your local machine or your Docker container, whichever you will use to deploy uh, our BATH network, and then um, get it signed from the administration organization. Um, so in this case, it will loop through the channels and um, each organization in a channel will have a role. So in this case, we have one creator of the channel, 
um, which will be in this case the administrator, um, which will then be responsible for signing that configuration block. So once it has been signed by the creator of the channel, we know, okay, it's valid and we can continue on uh, with the deployment. So um, once we have signed and updated that, we can use that configuration block in the final step of the um, main part of Agony the new organization. We can uh, join the new peers to the channel. So it will fetch that block. So block zero in this case, we've updated that block. So it's now the updated state of the network and it will join the peers of a new organization to the channel. So if we skip ahead in our video, to uh, let's see about uh, 19 minutes. Um, it's a bit ahead. Yeah, so here on the left, you will see that our deployment will wait for the join channel job to be complete. So if we skip ahead, we see that that job is running and that at about 20 minutes into our deployment, uh, we have joined um, the peer to the channel. So now uh, the last step that we have to do is that we can uh, deploy the chain code on that new organization. So in the channel, we have to find uh, a chain code that we've uh, developed as part of our reference application that Suvajit has mentioned. And we will now go ahead with uh, deploying that onto the peer, uh, onto the channel, excuse me. And you see again that we will uh, execute some jobs. So we have the install uh, chain code, which is running on the right. And then with the new life cycle, as I've mentioned, we will have, uh, let's see, um, we have also will have uh, a proof and invoke part of there. So we have for that new organization, we will have the approved chain code job and we'll have the uh, invoke chain code job. So now we're at the end of our deployment. So we've deployed a new organization and added that to um, the existing channel. So what we can do as a last part is to uh, use the, our CLI for that peer to just validate that everything has gone right. So we will take that um, CLI for the store. We can um, execute some commands to uh, access the bash terminal of that, uh, uh, of that peer CLI. And then we can execute some commands that are part basically of the, of the peer CLI to just validate that everything is working. So the first thing we do is that we fetch the channels, uh, which the spear is on. So you see that it has joined the all channel um, channel, which is the name that we use for our channel in our deployments. And then the next thing that we can do is um, just validate everything for the chain code. So we will first fetch uh, the install chain codes on the peer. So we will use the um, lifecycle for this. So you see that we have some chain codes installed. The next thing that we will do is um, to query the um, approved chain codes, uh, the committed chain codes, apologies. So we see here that we have some committed chain codes definitions. Uh, we see here the version and the sequence of it. And we also see the plugins that we can use for the endorsement. And the final thing that we will do is to check that the committed chain codes have also been approved. So we see here that there is uh, the approved chain code on here, which uh, with a package ID. So we see that this new organization has now been correctly added to um, the existing network. So that is basically uh, on a high level, uh, our demo for adding a new organization. Uh, in the background, there will happen a lot of complicated things, but uh, yeah, to, to uh, time constraints, I have not dived that deep uh, into it. If you have any questions on the, the inner workings of the demo, please feel free to ask. Um, and yeah, also we are still, uh, like Sufjit and Priyanka have mentioned, still in active development of this Fabric 2.2 feature branch. Um, so we're still looking for contributors on that. We still have some really interesting issues that are still, uh, well, issues, well, stories and features that we are deploying. Uh, uh, for this Fabric 2.2 branch. So any contributors are uh, very welcome. Um, so let me just check if there are any questions in the meanwhile that I can answer before I move on to the next part of the operational features. There are two questions. Um, the first one is by Samyak and he asked, where do you fetch the chain code package from? Can it be pulled directly and compiled from VCS? Um, so the chain code package, uh, like we say, we have some chain code that we have developed. Um, 
uh, as part of our reference application. So if we uh, open the network.yaml uh, quickly, I see that Shonak would like to answer this question. So I'll also maybe hand it over to Shonak so he can, uh, he can answer that question. Go ahead, Shonak. Uh, no, I, was, I just marked it because you are already answering it live or not. Ah. Right, but I think uh, the the answer to that question is the chain code package is fetched from a Git repository, which I guess yeah. you were getting to. Yes. Um, so in our organization, we have a, a chain code section um, which will uh, supply the uh, the the information that we need for that chain code. So here you see a a repository um, uh, variable inside of the chain code. So in this case, we are using the blockchain automation framework uh, Git repository, which will have the uh, chain code in our examples uh, supply chain app. But this can be any uh, uh, Git repository. So for example, if you want to use the, the um, Fabric samples repository, you can use that one as well. You can deploy the Fabcar chain code on it. So anything that is on a, on a repository, um, you can uh, pass that here as variables. So we will deploy that chain code uh, onto the network. Yes. So to and answer your question, yes, uh, it's a fetch from PCS. Yeah. And to add on to that, uh, it's totally pluggable, uh, as Arnold mentioned, and we have used it uh, in three different production uh, yep. systems uh, with different use cases, different chain codes. Yes, I believe that the chain code that we use is based on, on Go. Uh, I know that we've also deployed Java chain code on it. I don't, I don't know for sure if we've deployed JavaScript uh, chain codes. Uh, but then we have covered the three main uh, supported languages for chain code on Fabric. Right. Is there any more questions, uh, yes. Priyanka? So can BAF integrate with external CAs for getting crypto material or is it something that's planned further down the line? We have um, yeah, for, for that, I'd like to hand over to Shona because I don't know the answer to that. Maybe Shona can answer that. Yeah, so uh, uh, BAF, uh, as of now, it does not integrate with an external CA. Uh, and uh, if you need that feature, you are always welcome to submit a PR. And it answer, is uh, not, uh, yeah, and it is not planned uh, further down the line by the current maintainers of the project. Yes, and I think that's that's one of the main charms of an open source project, right? Like you mentioned, Shonak, if you want to add it, you can always submit a PR to the to the repository, and if it's uh, if it's possible, then we will sure uh, look into, into integrating that. Yeah, and the next question is about where it is running. As I think we, uh, Subhajit also said that it is running on on Kubernetes cluster. And um, Arnold, can you just show where the Kubernetes cluster details are mentioned? So uh, it's yes. under the KTS, uh, mm, sorry, yeah, Kubernetes one. section, right? For each, so yes. each organization has a section called KTS where you can run, where you pass your Kubernetes, uh, the region, if you are running on AWS, you don't need it on other. Um, and then the context, which is the cube, cube context and, and the config file, which is your cube config file. And that's all, and it doesn't um, actually, need, it can be any Kubernetes, it doesn't have to be AWS. I mean, this demo was on AWS. Yeah. There's a REST API layer in the block diagram in one of the slides earlier on. Custom uh, uh, Okay, so that REST API is, I think it was at the application level, uh, so which yep. does not have anything to do with uh, with uh, uh, with the, uh, what we sh saw today. So we, we have the REST API at the application level and that's a part of the supply chain application that we have uh, sample. And uh, why do we have a REST API is because our supply chain front end um, talks seamlessly to um, the to either Fabric, Corda or Corum um, backend. Uh, and uh, that is, the REST API in that case provides uh, the, the Express API provides the um, uh, abstraction and the REST API is only applicable in case of Fabric, which we, which we have as an example. Again, it's a part of the sample application. Yes. Um, 
Yeah, so let me just quickly look at the time that we have still. Um, yeah, so like we mentioned, um, we, we also have some operational feature which is still a, a work in progress. So I will not be showing a demo for that. So I'll just be going through the same uh, master playbook that we have for the organization. So again, for this new- uh, Arnold, sorry, um, just yeah. uh, let's check with Arun. Arun, do we have- Ah, yes. Or um, because it's- we have, we have 10 more minutes. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Ten more minutes. Okay. Yeah. If we have ten more minutes, then I'll I'll hand it over for uh, the next uh, live demo and the closing statements uh, by Suvijit. Thank you, Priyanka, for checking that. So uh, I'll hand it over to Suvijit. I'll uh, stop sharing my screen, and you can take it over. Yep. Thanks, Abnot. Thanks for your detailed explanation. So uh, it makes my job much easier. So I'll go quickly. Because uh, the next uh, demo uh, which we're going to show is about um, rem automation of uh, removal of an organization. So the automation, as we already mentioned, uh, BAV does in a consistent way and the uh, basis of the flow remains the same. So I'll just quickly share my screen. Um, I have a pre-recorded uh, demo as well as I'll be uh, taking you uh, through our code structure, our code flow. Uh, so uh, like in the previous, uh, similar to the previous uh, on the left screen is the Ansible controller machine where uh, we run the uh, playbook. The playbook in this case is the remove organization.yaml. So if you ha have our latest code from the feature branch, you'll have this under your um, Hyperledger fabric uh, configuration uh, folder. Uh, we pass the same uh, a uh, single uh, configuration file, which was uh, used to addition of an organization. It will have the, uh, I'll, I'll show that in details, but yeah, I mean, as we said that uh, we, we have a single configuration file. So all we do is that we change some of the configurations there and uh, run the playbook. Uh, on the right side, you uh, have the uh, deployments, which are uh, shown on the, uh, uh, which are on the Kubernetes cluster. Um, this, uh, the warehouse was, um, just in the previous demo, it was shown that the warehouse organization was added to the network. So with that, I'll just quickly switch to, uh, the uh, code where I'll talk about, uh, the playbook, which, uh, does the removal of an organization. Uh, is my VS code visible to everyone? Yes. Yep. Thank you. All right. So uh, this is the uh, playbook, uh, which does the removal of an organization. So in terms of adding an organization, it, it is a similar process, but uh, more uh, simpler than adding an organization. So uh, the whole process of uh, removal of an organization, uh, we have automated it and kind of divided into simple um, uh, roles or uh, steps, I would say. So these are uh, the roles, uh, as you see here, are the ones which are used to do that. So basically, uh, if I st have to start with the uh, the thing is that first uh, it kind of generates a script uh, which kind of modifies the configuration block uh, to uh, to kind of add the uh, organization which we want to remove. So the next role, as you see, is uh, kind of uh, talks about uh, configuration fetching the configuration block, uh, and also the next one is. Um, uh, after editing the configuration block, it signs and updates it. Once that is done uh, and the uh, configuration uh, block is committed to the channel, uh, uh, to the channel, the other cleanup happens, which is a cleanup of our Kubernetes cluster. It also kind of, uh, I mean, cleanup, not the whole cluster, just the organization part, which is uh, also removal of the cryptos, which was previously generated and put into vault, and also the flux releases, which will uh, kind of remove the deployments from our uh, Kubernetes cluster. So this is the base uh, uh, playbook, which removes that. So uh, these are the roles and it kind of uh, further calls task and sub roles. So I'll not go into much details because I already explained by I've not in the previous video, it, the, the functionality of removal is kind of same. Uh, the updation of the configuration block and then uh, signing it by all the uh, peer uh, peers in the channel and then committing it. So uh, I'll quickly go to the demo and uh, on the demo, what you'll see is that uh, the, the same automation happening in sequence. So uh, with further ado, I'll just play it. Uh, yeah, before, before I do that, uh, I also like to kind of uh, talk about the uh, changes which was made on the uh, configuration file, the network YAML file. 
So major changes I'll just talk about quickly uh, as we don't have much time. So, uh, yeah, so this is the uh, configuration file. This is the same configuration file which was used to add of the uh, adding the organization, the store organization. Uh, basically, when Arbna talked about the org status, he said that there would be other options available for that or other uh, values that can be passed here. So for a uh, case of a removal org, or all we need to do is that we change the org status to delete. So there are automation kind of picks that up and knows that this needs to be, this organization needs to be deleted. And the organizations which are already there and we don't want to do anything with that, it's just org status still remains as existing. So uh, this information needs to be added to the cha to the organization or the participants uh, list in the channels as well as uh, in the uh, organization field uh, list, which is here the last one, which is the store. We kind of uh, add the org status as delete here. So uh, this is the single configuration which will be used to um, removal of the organization, and I'll start the uh, playbook. I'll start the, uh, yeah. So I'll just quickly pause and you see that uh, it kind of picks the first uh, role, which is like, uh, I mean, I just skip it. I'll go back one step. Uh, yes, so as you see that it kind of starts with the creation of the uh, delete org script and then uh, it moves to the next role, uh, which is about uh, fetching the config block. So uh, in, in our network uh, configuration file, we have uh, one organization uh, under the channels, which is the uh, which is tagged as a creator. So uh, the first, the uh, creator, it checks for whether the, uh, the creator, uh, the uh, peer CLI for the creator organization is up and running or not. Once it confirms that it uses the peer uh, CLI uh, to fetch the configuration block. So uh, in our case, the uh, uh, we'll go back. Uh, uh, in our case, the carrier is the one which is the um, which is the creator organization. So once it fetches the uh, configuration block, it updates and signs it. Once uh, the signing process involves uh, in our policies, what we have uh, mentioned that we have kept it default. So the signing process needs to happen pro by uh, all the participating organization. So it will loop through all the participating organizations and uh, it will sign the configuration block the updated one so it, it, here if you see it does it, it checks all the uh, uh, peer cli of the participating organizations and connects to that and signs that so the signing happens uh, through the admin account of all the organizations so it uses the admin uh, to uh, do the signing so uh, once the uh, once the channels are signed the uh, creator organization kind of updates the channel uh, with the new configuration block. So this is what is happening here right now, as you see in the uh, left-hand side of your uh, screen. And I'll move forward. So once that step is done, the, uh, uh, once that step is done, the part of uh, where uh, it kind of, uh, uh, the fabric related stuff is done here. So on the next step of the uh, automation, which I said is to kind of clean up the uh, cluster, uh, not, not complete cleanup, but the cleanup of the organization's uh, artifacts or deployments, which are there on the cluster. So this is what is happening. The first one kind of uh, removes the cryptos, which are stored in the vault for that organization. So, uh, I mean, before doing that, it kind of tests the Kubernetes connection. It installs the required CLIs like the AWS CLI because we are using the AWS EKS in, a, in this case. It kind of deletes, as you say, deletes the ambassador uh, credentials. It deletes other cryptos. And um, uh, it will also next uh, delete, as you see on the right-hand side, it has started terminating the uh, the various deployments of the uh, store uh, net, which is the store organization. So it's clearing up the uh, organization uh, store. It also deletes namespace and then 
Yep. So that with that, I'll forward it. And as you see, uh, it does that through. It does not directly do that. It kind of uh, deletes the files and pushes them into uh, into our repository. And the plug sync works and picks that up and applies that for on the Kubernetes. So with that, we see that the deployment is done and uh, the uh, termination has al already started for the pods. So with that, I'll just close. And uh, yeah, if you guys have questions, please ask. Yeah, I think I've already answered uh, quite a few questions. So uh, is there anything open? I'm not sure how if uh, I think the next session is pending, right? Right. Thanks, Sajid. Priyanka, you are speaking on mute. Yes, sorry. So the last thing I wanted to cover, Arun, just one minute, two minutes, maybe, uh, that we still have a lot more to do. Um, you know, there's a lot of things, a lot of operational features in our roadmap. So I would request the com community here to be uh, um, more active and contribute. And uh, if you have evidence, uh, you know, um, from the client conversations that you are having, that there are more things that the client are asking, we uh, would welcome that as well. So uh, please come to the GitHub raise issues, raise pull requests, and contribute. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks. Thank you, um, everyone. Thanks. Um, thank you to Accenture team as a whole. It, it was a great session. And up next, we have our next session from Ironworks team on Hyperledger Aries. For that, I'll hand it over to Kiran and Ankita. Yeah, thanks, Arun. Um, I'll, I'll probably request Ankita to share the screen. Ankita, can you do that? Uh, and then probably because Ankita is going to walk us through all the uh, things that we have to put, put together rather. Yeah, but thanks to the Hyperledger India chapter for giving this opportunity to us uh, once again, rather. Yeah. Yeah, Ankita, can you share the screen, please? Uh, yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is Ankita from Ironworks. <clears throat> now, let me share my screen to all of you. <clears throat> uh, let me know when you'll be able to see my screen. Yeah, we can see your screen. Oh. Um, so uh, thank you uh, for, thank you. I sincerely thank Happy Luther India chapter for giving this opportunity and uh, happy like every time to present what's going on. So, uh, we will be presenting Hyperledger ARIS, all about ARIS today. And, and let's move on to today's agenda. So we'll quickly have a look at uh, what we are, uh, what we are at Ironworks and what we are working on. And then we will know about Hyperledger ARIS, what is going into the ARIS, what it is, what it, where it is placed, everything. And then we'll um, get to know about the repositories which are maintained under ARIS and uh, contribution that we are making into. And uh, we'll let you know how you can contribute to um, uh, the forum. So I would like Kalyan to take over to the introduction about uh, uh, Ironworks. Yeah, Kalyan, please. Oh, okay. Thanks, Andrew. Can you go to the next slide? Next one. Yeah, very briefly, uh, Ironworks um, is a small uh, boutique. Uh, we are specifically working into the uh, blockchain space. I think we can skip this slide and get out and go to the next one. <clears throat> right, so uh, we are about to complete our six years mark in a couple of months from now, of which uh, I can say five years we have been into blockchain space. Uh, so we, we actually are a blockchain startup, we can say. From last two and a half years, we have been very specifically working in a very focused manner into the hyperledger Aries in this stack, which is to do with the self-sovereign identity, uh, which is why we believe that we can present uh, about hyperledger Aries in a, a little elaborative manner over here in today's uh, tech fest, brother. Yeah. So um, over the last five years, we have been working on various uh, implementations to do with uh, hyperledger fabric to start with and sawtooth, and, um, and then we moved on to. Uh, Hyperledger Aries uh, stack of technology, where we are actually working with some of our enterprise customers to work on 
uh, some of the problems that they are having with the identity space in the identity space rather yeah. Uh, we also are part of uh, various forums which are dedicatedly be working across the globe on the uh, uh, self-sovereign or decentralized identity as well. We are, we are part of sovereign network. We are actually uh, part of the Trust Over IP Foundation as well. We'll of, of course cover that in subsequent slide. We are also one of the contributing members to the uh, decentralized identity foundation, which is another uh, you know, foundation which is working into the uh, identity space rather. Right, and and um, we also have a small uh, uh, setup in Ireland, which is focused on purely business standpoint, but entirely based out of India. <clears throat> and and uh, we look forward to contributing every possible way to the community, giving it back to the community, and leveraging the open source and um, uh, bringing our expertise and the experience that we have earned over a period of last two two to three years in the SSI space, rather. Yeah. Uh, quickly, next slide, Ankita. Uh, because I don't want to spend too much of time on this slide, just introduce to all of us and then we move to the core part of the presentation. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah. quickly, as I said, uh, close to six years now, uh, uh, we have been working across customers in, on all uh, seven geographies with 15 plus countries and uh, customers. And we are a 25 to 30 member team, which is mighty in its own size though. Uh, yeah, that's all about uh, what we are into. Um, and now I'll take a pause here and I'll probably hand it over back to Ankita to deep dive into the Aries uh, stack here. Over to you, Ankita. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Kalyan, for this very quick but brief introduction. So let's move on to what is Aries? What is Hyperledger Aries project that is under the Hyperledger umbrella? So before, before moving on to uh, Hyperledger Aris, let me quickly brief you about how, what is identity and how it is managed these days. So uh, the, all the identities that we are having right from our birth certificate to email address, to username, passwords, or uh, graduation certificates or everything, these are borrowed identities that we have. So uh, any of the organization or the issuer has given us these identities and we are just owning those identities or, or using those identities to prove ourselves one or the other place. So these are um, the identities which are kept safe with the organization that has provided us. So this is the current model of identity we are, the world is using. Uh, moving on to the next thing that is self-sovereign identity, which talks about um, as a user, I will be the um, owner of my own identity. All the other organizations that those uh, are the issuers that, that are giving me the identity, but I, I will own the identity whole and soul. So this is what self-sovereign identity or SSI is about. And with this decentralized SSI, uh, this decentralized identity concept, I will be the driver of my own identity. I know when to share, what to share, and uh, how to share, and why I want to share with someone else without, uh, without being forging with the uh, identity that is provided to me. So there, is, um, uh, there will be multiple roles in this ecosystem. Uh, mainly, there will be three type of users. Uh, one will be the issuer, the issuer which will provide or which will give the identity that is uh, we call it as verifiable credential because these credentials will be digitally verifiable so these credentials are given by the issuer and the holder will acquire store and uh, present the credentials whenever required and the verifier is a role which will verify uh, the credential which is given to the user. Let's say if uh, I have an email address or I have a graduation certificate. So the organization that is uh, asking for my uh, identities, that will be a verifier. And of course, the blockchain ledger will be the single source of truth where um, uh, which will maintain the status of the credential of the certificates of the credentials that is um, given by the issuer to the holder. But where the credential actually lies? So the credential actually lies within with the holder, with the, within the wallet that is provided to the holder. So uh, in this way, the holder is the sole responsible of his own identity. And uh, um, um, the uh, concept of SSI works with the on the same lines. So let's come back to ARIS. This is about 
how the decentralized identity will work, what will be the workflow and data model and everything. So let's come back to ARIS again. So uh, what, what ARIS is? So ARIS is, a, uh, is grew out, out of the effort which community was building with Hyperledger Indie, uh, which is the blockchain for distributed identities. So they realized that the client component that enables peer-to-peer -peer interaction, peer-to-peer -peer interaction uh, between the parties and the protocols can be more reusable and it can be extensive, extendable to other blockchain, uh, uh, blockchain platforms like the other blockchain uh, projects we, are, we have. So it can be extendable to other blockchain platforms in order to use the verifiable claims in different contexts. So it provides shared, reusable, and interoperable toolkit, uh, which is to create, transmit, and store the verifiable credential, and which are cryptographically safe. And uh, uh, the key management system works on, um, it uses Hyperledger Ursa to manage the keys and secure, uh, and secure the secret management. So the key characteristics that Hyperledger ARIS uh, um, has are uh, uh, wallet infrastructure. So wallet infrastructure uh, can be used for secure storage of cryptographic secrets. That can be my digital ident uh, decentralized identifier or the credentials or any other information that are used to build the bl um, blockchain client that we refer to as agents here. So, uh, the wallet infrastructure is a secure storage technology. The next characteristic is blockchain client that we also refer to as a resolver. So it is an interface for creating and signing of the transaction on one or the other ledger. Then the next is secure messaging. Uh, this feature allows off ledger interaction. So uh, between agents. So there are two agents, one for, um, let's say, Ellis and Bob, they want to communicate with each other. So the messages which will go from Ellis to Bob, they, they should be secured messages by uh, one or the other uh, mean, and uh, that can use multiple transport protocols that can be, uh, that can uh, go via HTTP or uh, TCP IP or any other protocol, like Bluetooth or a, a, any other protocol we have. So this secure me messaging, um, we refer to as, uh, in ARIS, it is DID communication, we refer to as DITCOM messaging. And the next is uh, API infrastructure. So API infrastructure are the mechanisms uh, to build high level protocols based on DITCOMs. So what type of data will flow? What, uh, what will be the me message structure? How VCs uh, can be issued and uh, everything. So this is where uh, Hyperledger ARIS lies. So it uses uh, Hyperledger Indie as a decentralized identity, and it can use uh, um, any of the ledger. Um, uh, like if we have DIDs on Ethereum or um, any other ledger, it can use the, those as well. So it is pluggable. And it uses cryptographic library from Hyperledger Ursa that provides wallet security, your key management systems, uh, key management and uh, signatures and proofs that you present. So all the cryptographic hash, uh, cryptographic libraries provided by URSA are consumed in ARIS. So um, uh, this is an aerial view of how agents will look like. So everything, uh, all the individual, the identity owner, I as an identity owner of um, few of my identities. So an organization can have its own identities. Any of the natural thing can have an identity. All the appliances, man-made things, sensors, and everything, they can also have their own identities. Mm -hmm. So um, all, these, um, the, all these identity owners, uh, they, they will have their own agents because they will have their own decentralized identity. We call it as DID. So that DID is managed under the wallet. So every identity owner will have a, a, a agent which will, which will manage the wallet. And uh, the, the agencies like the issuing authority or the verifying authority or any other peer that wants to verify or issue the credentials, 
they also have, will have their own agents and wallets. So these two agents will communicate with each other over a secure messaging system that we refer to as DITCOM. So this is an aerial view of how agents will look like, what all different agents can we can have. We can have cloud agents, edge agents, mobile agents for that matter. So uh, this is all agents that uh, ARIS uh, provides. So um, there was a saying that uh, uh, seeing is believing, uh, but in this digital era of, uh, of uh, advanced technology, we can mimic everything about a person, everything and anything about a person. So what you see need not necessary what you believe. So ARIS is about agents uh, that are connecting, uh, connecting and enabling trust over internet. So it is about making digital systems more like human systems. So this, there is an ARIS RFC uh, that talks about trust over IP, trust over internet uh, uh, stack that introduce a complete architecture of uh, bringing technology trust in human interaction. And uh, um, Ironworks is a contributor in TOIP, um, TOIP Foundation and holds co-chair for governance stack and uh, vice chair for technology stack working group. So uh, there are different layers of this um, trust over IP. So the very basic layer is DIDs where every entity will be tagged to the decentralized identifier, the unique identifier that will define an identity. Uh, that will define an entity, which is provided by Hyperledger entity. So the next step, uh, the next layer is DITCOM protocol uh, that establish a cryptographic means or a secure mean by which two agents can communicate with each other. Uh, the next layer is data exchange protocol. So the first two layers, uh, they establish cryptographic trust. We can say it as a technical trust between the peers. So the three and fourth layer, they are human trust between the organization, individual things that they are using like sensors, devices, appliances, etc. So the goal here is to standardize all this, all supported credential exchange protocols uh, that, are, uh, that are verifiable credential exchange protocols that are given and standards that are given by W3C. <laughs> And um, the next, the fourth layer is application ecosystem layer, like just an application calls a TCIP, uh, TCP IP stack uh, for communication over internet. So the app will call a TOIP stack to register DIDs or to make connections or for credential exchange or to engage in any of the three layers that are below it. So this is all about how you can bring uh, trust in the, uh, over the internet or trust on a trustless interaction. So this was about um, uh, ARIS, where it is placed. Can I, uh, Akita, can I add quickly about trust or IP as well, a very brief way, yeah. if you're okay with that? Yeah, yes, so sir. trust or IP foundation has uh, recently been formed somewhere in the month of March or April, uh, wherein uh, some of the veterans working in the in the identity space uh, actually felt, realized that there is definitely a need to bring trust over a trustless network. And just like we have a concept of voice over I, uh, IP, the concept of trust over IP has been brought in and it's entirely emphasizing on how we can have a trusted or uh, cryptographically, algorithmically establishing a trust between the interactions people have over the internet with each other from any corner of the world. Yeah. So this is catching up a lot of momentum there now. And uh, we would really encourage uh, everyone to participate, be an observer, listen to what is happening, because this is technology in the making now. Uh, before it starts getting as a receiving, uh, uh, before we start getting out the deliverables and components and building block coming out is right time to just engage and start looking at what is happening. We can join as organizations or you can join as individuals as well at the same time. Yeah. Thanks, Ankita. Yeah. Right. So um, 
Kalan has already shared few links where you can go through the Trust Over Trust Over IP Foundation. You can uh, check about Ares uh, project that is uh, over there, and uh, this RFC that is specifically provided by that is this is one of the RFC that is provided by Ares. So, moving on to the business use cases of SSI or um, business use cases that uh, hyperledger areas can bring in so there are a plenty there are plenty of use cases that uh, that 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 can be there so very basic are trusted data transfer so it's not just about sharing the data it's about sharing the data safely and securely so that privacy is preserved so trusted data transfer uh verified cvs and qualifications I, if i want to um, check whether this uh, the particular cv that is given uh, that that is in front of me is valid or it is not forged with uh, similarly with the um, certificates the graduation certificates or in um, certificates that we have the qualifications the kyc process uh, which is in um, which is in multiple sectors that can also be a use case of it uh cross border trust uh digital passports we are talking here about so this this can also be one of uh, the use case of uh, um, the aris stack and also in healthcare uh healthcare systems the um, healthcare reports management and uh, security of the uh, data of the patients and everything that can also be the use cases of um, decentralized identity or ssi so there are few use cases apart from that that we are working on our um, um, transfer of ownership of the verifiable credentials the assets they can be tickets or um, any of the assets that you are owning so if a you person is owning some asset then how that can be a verifiable credential and how that the ownership can be transferred from one user to another user and um, there 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 can be use cases where iot devices can be um, uh, iot devices can have their digital identities and uh, suppose I, if i want to have access to uh, the door of the racks the server racks so uh, how uh, i can ensure a non forged identity that this is the identity i uh, i i belong to and this is the identity that has an uh, ownership or access for the particular rack so dids can be installed on uh, dids can be uh, in, can be uh, attached to the device dids can be attached to devices to the person and uh, um, the credential can be um, the credential can um, be provided to the user to the holder and the device can verify the credential that is given to the holder so the door racks or the bike uh that have installed an iot devices that those devices can uh, uh can verify the credentials or the uh, access of that is provided to the holder so these are couple of use cases that um, um hyperledger ares or ssi uh, brings in or leverage uh there are different repositories maintained under ares uh, frame uh, hyperledger ares so we call it as frameworks and agents so there are different frameworks there are different agents which can be uh, which can be uh, which can serve a person to um, to maintain its wallet its dids and to use the protocols for the verifiable credential exchange and proof verifications so the couple of frameworks that are um, that are over there are um, uh, aris cloud agent python so it's uh, it's uh, it's an uh, uh, agent that is uh, written in python and uh, it can be used for any non mobile agent scenario uh, it's a cloud agent basically used for issuers verifiers or storing of the credentials or anything uh, it can be used as an enterprise edge agent as well and the main contributor is um, uh, the bc gov and we are contributing to one of um, the rfc the one of the protocol that is given in uh, that is need 
for deployments uh, for endorsing the transactions. So you can go to the GitHub of uh, this framework as well. Uh, there is another framework for uh, which is uh, getting developed in JavaScript. So it is also an SSI agent which leveraged DITCOM and DID based communications and uh, storing of the VCs, uh, verifiable credentials and exchanging the proofs. And uh, uh, it also provides the edge agent. These are uh, all uh, enterprise edge agents which can be used in a non-mobile scenario agent scenario. So we are contributing for multi for implementing multiple ARIS RFCs that are provided um, uh, in the JavaScript framework as well. So there is one more framework that is uh, written in .NET and uh, .NET can be used for building mobile as well via Xamarin. Uh, and it can be used as edge agent and mobile agent both. And the main maintainer uh, here is Trinsic and we are contributing for enhancements and everything. And um, uh, there is one mobile agent. All the uh, all the agents that we discussed were uh, for uh, cloud agents. They were for enterprise edge agents. But we have a mobile agent as well, which uh, um, so I would like Amit to talk about it because he is the main contributor and maintainer over here. So Amit, Hi. would you please? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Ankita. So yeah, uh, if we talk about, uh, let me start with the basics. So if we talk about the wallet, so what is a wallet? So wallet is a is a is a place where you you add all stuff into that. If if we have a, a physical wallet, then we can add a cash, card, photos, and all things. So an identity wallet, it's just a combination of agents and 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 uh, an indie wallet. So where wallet you can store all the credential which uh, issuing party or the uh, or uh, any organization can issue those credential you just store in in your digital wallet so in a, if we talk uh, on, on a holder side so there is the uh, three party that ankita already mentioned one is a issuer one is a verifier and another is a holder so in ssi paradigm there is there is a triangle we can say triangle so if we talk about the holder specific so every holder needs uh, needs have their wallet so where they can they can store his credential for example if we, if any government wants to issue the government id card so every citizen of that country needs a wallet and and that wallet can capable uh, uh, capable to store the uh, ssi based credential and whenever user need, need, needs to prove that credential they can easily uh, easily provide that credential so mostly holder can use the mobile app in today's uh, today's world if you are seeing the mobile is uh, mobile makes our life more easier so so we we, we are developing a, 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 a indie aries mobile agent we are uh, we are called as anima so it's a aries react native mobile agent so there is a two type of agent in uh, for if we are talking on a mobile so one is a cloud agent one and one is a age agent so in a cloud agent everything will deploy on on the server so your wallet will be created on server so all your heavy cryptographical library are processed on a, on a server in in the cloud yeah so in the in, in this uh, in this scenario you, you you just need to use those rest api through that you can create one your mobile application or if we have existing mobile application so you just uh, plug in those api and you you can uh, create your your identity wallet so uh, to use the use the cloud agent again it's not a pure ssi based uh, solution because when we when we talk about uh, ssi solution first uh, character characteristic comes is a decentralized so uh, for the decentralized we need a age age wallet for for every holders so we 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 team team of uh, few members we uh, team of ironworks we created one one react native mobile agent so this is a lightweight uh, mobile agent for the holder specific because holders never need to do a create a credential things and never need to create a revocation registry and, and all things so it's a lightweight agent we guess we can say that 
and again whenever you want to connect with any counterparty you just uh, scan the qr code and uh, executing the aries based uh, connection protocol so yeah we we recently uh, 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 create one branch on on the repository and we have added the connection flow so subsequently we are also working on a flutter part so recently uh, we our team is started working working on a flutter uh, uh, aries and indie base uh, sdk in a flutter as well so as ankita mentioned if if you have a uh, if you have a some existing uh, use case of your of your business so easily you can plug plug uh, plug our sdk into into your your uh, uh in your system for example uh right now we, we we on a mobile banking we can see whenever we we, we want to do any transaction again we, we receive otp so if we if we uh, we are on out of country so it's time we are it's a difficult to receiving the otp so in existing uh, banking application usually using this sdk you can you can implement a pure ssi based uh, uh, credential verification flow so yeah so arnima is a open source uh, mobile agent for react native so currently if if anyone have a existing react native application and they wants to use use uh, 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 india is based uh, credential flows so just they can uh, use this sdk and achieve those things so if we if you go to the uh, uh, below link you can find all the all the information about about the sdk how you can use what what are the basic uh, uh, packages that uh, needed for it and all things ankita can you please uh, move forward so yeah apart from this uh, few few more agent are also available uh, on a different language so there is uh, one agent is available on a go language as well uh, we have also a uh, a static uh, agent in python so the, they they have some sp uh, static issuer uh, issuer you, so you can just uh, connect and you can you can easily start uh, exploring the ssi things so uh, in ruby if there is also agent available and java, uh, java as well so yeah can you please yeah so if if you want to contribute how you can contribute obviously we have questions so because i i, I know java how i can contribute so if you want to contribute uh, so there are some some uh, links and uh, chat options are available so there is a, a weekly uh, zoom calls are available for a hyperledger uh, working group so there is a one wiki page for that uh, there you can find all the call related information what are the stuff is discussed on past call or what what will be discussed on next call so based on your interest you can you can join those working group call as well we also have a, a rocket chat chat uh, yeah right. we we also have a rocket chat option so where uh, everyone can sh share uh those uh, doubts and and uh, useful uh, links and resources where everyone can easily learn and clear their doubts so yeah here you can see the hyperledger uh, uh, wiki page so yeah all the things you can find here apart from uh, apart from this uh... yeah so this is what uh, this is what aris is all about and uh, how you can contribute to the the project that aris brings in uh, thank so, you yeah this was all about um, what we were intended to present over there and uh, uh, in uh, in the situation where we are getting the laws like gdpr and pdp where a data protection is the key uh, key for any individual any organization which are getting the data uh, of the users which are storing the data of the users so right to forget the data is one of uh, the key thing that every organization has to keep in mind with the before storing or getting the details so ssi or decentralized identity can uh, fit in um, with all these laws um, which are coming over here so 
this is what uh, we were we were uh, to present today uh, so thank you for giving us this opportunity uh, any questions if you would have we can just take those up Uh, no question ankita thank you good okay thank you and works team thank you yeah thank and you. i'll probably stop recording this concludes the session